All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. Yes, sir, reading you loud and clear. Roger, roll, Discovery. Discovery, Roger, no problem. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the June 17, 2020 edition of Space News. This is Peter Ald, and tonight I'm joined by Tina Stagg, and we welcome back Angelo de Grazia, and we're all from the Space Association of Australia. Let's get the show started with some Australian space news. Preparations in Western Australia for the construction of the world's largest telescope are complete. After seven years of design and prototyping work, the Curtin University Node of International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research, has completed its preparations for the construction of the Square Kilometre Array, or SKA, in Western Australia, which will begin next year. A total of 130,000 individual radio antennas, along with associated electronics, will be built and spread over thousands of square kilometres at CSIRO's Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory, about 800 kilometres north of Perth. The array will work in tandem with an array of 197 dishes located in the Karoo in South Africa, north of Cape Town. To be built by a global collaboration of 14 countries, the SKA will be one of the world's largest science facilities, exploring the history and evolution of the universe and uncovering advances in fundamental physics. Now, the next-generation hybrid rocket that will launch small satellites into low Earth orbits from 2022 are being developed in Queensland. An advanced Queensland Industry Research Fellowship grant has been awarded to University Queensland Dr Ingo Jan to work with Gold Coast's Gilmore Space on propellant feed systems and cycles for space launch vehicles. Dr Jan said... Having researchers and industry work closely together was invaluable for Australia's space industry. Rather than buying products from overseas, the rockets and components will be manufactured in Australia, Dr Jean said. This is an essential step towards developing a space launch vehicle industry in Queensland, with many expected flow-down benefits to our manufacturing industries. The University of Queensland's team is focusing on the developing and validating the fuel feed system which must meet the stringent control and performance requirements of the launch system while also remaining as light as possible. And Australian Earth observation startup LatConnect60 has announced plans to hire York Space Systems to manufacture small satellites and operate its Earth observation constellation. LatConnect60 was founded last year and plans to launch its first satellite in 2021 and establish an initial constellation of three satellites with multiple payloads, including radio frequency detection sensors and spectral imaging cameras. By relying on artificial intelligence, each LatConnect 60 satellite will be able to autonomously geolocate and process RF signals identified in order to trigger its imaging payload and any other secondary payloads. LatConnect60 said it selected York in part because it offered to get the first satellite into orbit in well under nine months and at an attractive price point. The Department of Industry, Science, Innovation and Resources, in conjunction with the Australian Space Agency, has awarded Sabre Astronautics a $6 million grant for the development of Australia's Mission Control Centre. Branded as the Responsive Space Operations Centre, or RSOC for short, SABRE will bring next-generation space mission control technologies to make it easier to fly new spacecraft. Capabilities include concurrent design, pre-flight testing, launch support, as well as live operations during flight. The ROSOC will also be the first professional control centre in the world to use machine learning in spacecraft day-to-day operations, along with 3D gaming technologies. The ROSOC will sit on the ground floor of the McEwen building at Lot 14 in Adelaide and have a baseline capability ready in six months. Once completed, the ROSOC will support day-to-day mission control for small and medium enterprises using Sabre's technologies to reduce risk for investors. Australia has nearly 100 new space companies 
formed in the last three years and the space agency has the goal of growing to a $12 billion industry by 2030. And it's over to you, Tina. Thanks, Peter, and good evening, space fans. In NASA news, NASA has selected the longtime manager of its commercial crew program to be the next head of its overall human spaceflight efforts. Kathy Luders will take over as Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations, effective immediately. Luders, the first woman to hold that post, had been manager of the commercial crew program at the agency since 2014. Kathy gives us the extraordinary experience and passion we need to continue to move forward with Artemis and our goal of landing the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine said. He cited in particular her experience managing the commercial crew effort, including the successful launch of SpaceX's Demo 2 mission with two NASA astronauts on May 30. Luders joined NASA in 1992. And a new report confirms that a former NASA official is under investigation for contracting improprieties during a lunar lander competition. Sources said that NASA's Inspector General is examining if Doug Levero, who abruptly resigned as NASA's Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations in May, provided guidance to Boeing and a second competitor in the Human Landing System competition. Any assistance he provided to Boeing did not help the company, which failed to win an award. Neither NASA nor Lavero have publicly discussed why he resigned from the agency after less than six months on the job, but it was widely reported to be due to issues with the lander competition. And to the International Space Station, NASA is increasingly confident that the Crew Dragon spacecraft launched to the International Space Station last month will be able to stay there for at least a couple of months. NASA didn't set a duration for the Demo 2 mission when it launched on May 30, as it wanted to see how SpaceX's crewed vehicle operated in space. At a meeting last week, Ken Bowersox, who was NASA's Acting Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations, said the spacecraft was doing very well and he expected it to remain at the station until August. An extended stay would allow the Demo 2 crew of Bob Benken and Doug Hurley to support station operations, including spacewalks to replace batteries in the station's power system. To NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, NASA has selected Astrobotic to fly a rover to the south pole of the moon to look for water ice. Under a $199.5 million award announced last week, Astrobotic's Griffin Lander will carry NASA's Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, or VIPER, to the south pole of the moon in 2023. Viper, currently under development by NASA, will operate for at least 100 days, probing permanently shadowed regions of craters there for water ice that could support future missions. NASA made the award as part of its Commercial Lunar Payload Services program to purchase rides on commercial lunar landers for payloads. Astrobotic was one of seven companies that submitted bids and this is the second CLPS award won by the Pittsburgh-based company. And to the moon, NASA has awarded Northrop Grumman a $187 million contract to start work on a lunar gateway module. The contract covers initial design work on the Habitation and Logistics Outpost, or HALO module, which will serve as a habitat for crews visiting the gateway. A second contract will be awarded later for the construction and testing of the module. NASA said last year that it would issue Northrop with a sole source contract for HALO, concluding that the company was the only one that could have HALO ready to meet its 2024 deadline for returning humans to the moon. However, while NASA plans to launch HALO in late 2023 with another gateway module, the power and propulsion element, NASA officials recently said it's unlikely astronauts will use the gateway for that 2024 landing mission. 
and to NASA's planetary and space science programs. Next month's Mars 2020 launch has slipped three days because of a launch vehicle processing hiccup. NASA said it was now targeting 20th of July for the launch of the rover mission after an issue with ground equipment used for processing of the Atlas V launch vehicle caused a three-day delay. The overall launch window for the mission lasts until August 11. And an instrument on NASA's InSight Mars lander is finally below the surface. A heat flow probe was supposed to hammer into the surface of the planet last year, going as deep as 5 metres. But the probe had been stuck at only about 30 centimetres deep, with part of it still protruding above the surface. Recent efforts to use the lander's robotic arm to press down on top of the probe to prevent it from rebounding appear to have been successful, with new images from the lander showing the probe entirely below ground. Over to Angelo. Thanks, Tina. Now over to Russia. Dmitry Rogozin is sick and tired of trampoline jokes. Rogozin, head of Roscosmos, told the Russian edition of Forbes magazine that after the successful commercial crew launch last month, Americans lampooned Russia instead of thanking it. When our partners finally managed to conduct a successful test on their spacecraft, there were nothing but jokes and mockery directed at us, he said. As Russian Deputy Prime Minister in 2014, he threatened to revoke NASA's access to Soyuz spacecraft as retaliation for Western sanctions for Russia's annexation of Crimea, suggesting that the US would need a trampoline to get to the station. The trampoline is working, SpaceX's Elon Musk said after the commercial crew launch, referencing Rogozin's comment. Over to SpaceX. SpaceX completed its ninth bulk Starlink launch at the weekend, a mission that included a rideshare customer for the first time. SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket lifted off from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station carrying 58 Starlink broadband satellites instead of the usual 60. The rocket carried slightly fewer Starlink satellites to make room for three remote sensing SkySat satellites for Planet. The mission used a Falcon 9 booster that flew two cargo missions to the International Space Station for NASA, the last being CRS-20 in March. The rocket featured a previously flown payload fairing with one half recovered from the JCSAT-18 Pacific One satellite mission in December and the other from SpaceX's third Starlink mission, which took place in January. SpaceX recovered the rocket's first stage for a third time, landing the booster on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You in the Atlantic Ocean. The launch marks the beginning of the rideshare program SpaceX announced in August last year, offering regular opportunities for small sat operators to hitch a ride on Starlink missions. SpaceX boss Elon Musk is shifting his attention back to Starship vehicle development effort. In a recent email to employees, he told them to consider Starship the top SpaceX priority aside from the safe return of the Crew Dragon spacecraft. We need to accelerate Starship progress, he wrote, encouraging employees to consider working at the Starship development site in Texas. During an event at that site more than eight months ago, Musk set a goal of launching a Starship into orbit in six months. Since then, four Starship prototypes have been destroyed in ground tests, most recently after a static fire test on 29th of May. Okay, let's talk about Sea Launch. Russia's S7 Group is considering selling Sea Launch. S7 acquired Sea Launch from Energia in a deal announced in 2016 and recently moved the venture's mobile launch platform and command ship from California to Russia's Far East. However, S7 is facing major losses from its airline business because of the coronavirus pandemic and can't afford the costs to refurbish and operate the ships. Russian industry sources said a likely buyer of Sea Launch is Rosatom, Russia's state nuclear energy corporation, although it wasn't clear why it would be interested in Sea Launch's assets. Okay, over to Peter. Thanks, Angela. And finally this week, the first American woman to walk in space is also now the first woman to go to the deepest part of the ocean. 
Kathy Sullivan was the co-pilot of a submersible that recently visited Challenger Deep, more than 10,900 metres below the ocean surface in the Marianas Trench in the Pacific. Sullivan, a former naval oceanographer, was the first American woman to perform a spacewalk during a shuttle mission in 1984. After leaving NASA, she joined NOAA and later became its administrator. Well, that's all this week. Thank you, Tina and Angelo, and we'll speak to you again next week. Bye now.